Welcome to another episode of Outside the Valley, a podcast by ARC, the remote hiring platform that helps you hire senior remote software engineers easily. Here, we interview remote startup leaders, remote work advocates, and workers of distributed team who thrive outside of Silicon Valley. I'm your host, Jovian Gautama. This episode is quite unique because this is the first time I have more than one guest in an episode and also the first time I interviewed my co-workers. We recently launched a remote work FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions, and today we're going to discuss about how we think about all of these questions internally, both on the team level such as you know meetings, collaborations, communications, and on the personal level such as how to be productive, dealing with isolation, and more. So without further ado, let's introduce ourselves first to the audience. Hi everyone, I'm Christine. Um, I'm the head of marketing at ARC, and I'm based in Taipei, Taiwan. Um, and I've been working remotely for um, about a year, I would say, on and off. We do have an office, so I do go in there occasionally, but since end of January, I've been fully remote. Hi, this is Emiliano rodriguez Weiler. I'm a hiring consultant at ARC, I've been working remotely for two years and nine months. Hello, everyone. So I'm Ting, Ting Chang, and I recently joined ARC as a front-end developer around mid-January, and the company went fully remote end of January. So we recently launched this remote work FAQs because we see that, unfortunately, because of the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of companies need to go full remote. And abruptly, so to speak. So first question will be for, for all of you. So how has this COVID-19 pandemic affect you in your daily life and work life so far? I, I think that for me, I've gone through like all stages of grief. Like at mm-hmm. first it was like, I mean, I don't know the stages off the top of my head, but you go from like sadness to anger. Like, why is this happening to like, like finally at the end, you kind of accept accepted i mean since i'm in taiwan we've actually we faced the kind of self-quarantine a bit earlier like in february compared to the rest of the world so i think i've already gotten used to it but i think i've kind of turned all of the challenge i faced into kind of an opportunity like i see like working from home completely you know i'm full-time working from home now yeah it sucked at first because i didn't have all the ducks in a row but i've been able to like figure out a schedule that works for me and figure out the best way to support the team as well. So I've kind of gone through like the good and the bad and then turned out like I'm pretty, pretty happy. And I think the team is also getting more efficient at at working from home as well. So on my end, I actually recently, I wasn't a developer before I came to ARC. I was in investor relations and I did a career change because I was interested in getting into a profession that would allow remote work. So it was actually really cool coming into ARC and then having the whole pandemic, which is unfortunate, but it served as an opportunity to provide a chance to be fully remote within the company. So I thought that was pretty cool. Well, working from home every day, the biggest impact I felt is that, you know, not being able to step outside and do regular activities that I'm used to. I tell people that now are joining remote to take it with a grain of salt. It's not the same as it usually feels like for me that I've been doing this for a long time. You know, I can't think of, hey, man, we're going to have a beer Friday night. I'm going to do groceries. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to go to the cinema. I had to cancel some plans to travel. So it's a different dynamics mentally. And I've, I've spoke with other members that have done this before, and they agree that it's not the same feeling entirely. So take it with a grain of salt. You're just getting focused and working from home. Pretty much the same. As you guys know, like I've started working remotely full time since last year, right? But these couple of months, couple of weeks just feels different because like Emiliano mentioned, it's not about that you're working from home. It's because like you have less option to do other stuff, to unwind or something like that. So it, it kind of feels it's it's been harder in these couple of weeks. And also, you know, the, the mentally you are on a different state than the normal remote work situation. So it's very important to mentioned that this is not the normal remote work experience. This is like pandemic remote work experience. Exactly. I mean, I think that, yeah, remote work and work from home is not exactly the same. Like, I think a lot of people have already said that, you know, I mean, like other people, you know, I, I, from what I've heard and what I've read, it's, it's true, but it's also kind of like forcing you to get, I don't know, like I would say it forces you to really think about your daily routine because like, yeah, you can't leave or you can't leave for very long. 
Mm -hmm. So I think it, it just forces you to be even more clear about like what you're doing within the time and like, how do you within your house make space for like work life balance if you can't leave, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned before, <laughs> before we start recording, let's go through the, the questions on the remote work FAQs and then see how we can, you know, dive deep into it and discuss it more thoroughly. So the very first question here is what remote work essentials do I need to know? So this is like the very basic questions. It's mostly revolves around communication, actually, when I think about this question. So was there any change in the way you communicate with the team? I think it's a delicate balance of knowing when to jump on a call to solve something and knowing when to like write it down. So like writing things down is like, is, is known as like a best practice for remote teams, right? You need documentation, but yep. even when you think of like smaller examples, like, Hey, someone has a question and they're asking you to jump on a call for five minutes. My response, like by default would be, Hey, can you just write it down first? Because I think like it helps clarify your own thoughts. So it used to be the kind of person, like if I was in an office, I would just be like, sure. Like I'll sit and talk to you for those five minutes. But I think like overall, it's forced me to think about, hey, like, how can I use writing to like clarify things without having to just jump on a call? So I think that like my default has changed to writing. Try to write it down for myself or my teammates, ask them to write it down and then have a meeting if it's needed um, or jump on a call. And then again, write down the conclusions or what were the takeaways, what were the action items? So I think like in an office, this should be the best practice anyway, but it, it kind of just like, it makes it more clear that you need this when you're, when you're working from home or working remotely. I agree on uh, what Christine said. In an office setting, it's so much easier to kind of look over and kind of wave someone down or ask them if they can um, help you look over something. Whereas when you're working from home, you really, you can't really, you, you kind of want to get into that best practice of writing all, everything down as opposed to, hey, can we get hop on a call? Because if you look back into your Slack history or whatnot, it's just like you're hopping on calls and you don't really have that transcript of what may have happened that you want to look back into. And I guess especially for when you're asking questions about code-based code related stuff, it really forces you to be really clear about what you have to write. And in that aspect, sometimes the question you originally had, you found by thinking it out, typing it out, you actually solved it yourself. And you don't really need to hop on that five-minute call or 10-minute call. I actually mentioned and discussed this with uh, some of the interviewees and the guests. So I think personally, I personally think like in ARC, like before our documentation, it wasn't that good because everyone in the same office, like why not? So I think we're leaning towards to uh, a more um, documented approach. It's, so everything should, should not be on Slack by default. Even something recently, like we didn't even have a description of the Slack channels. And there's like, you know, like if you use Slack, there's like a thousand channels. Uh, we probably have, a, we probably have like 200, but we just like recently like made those descriptions. And that's something that's super helpful for like, even if you're new or even if you've been here, sometimes you wonder, Hey, what was that channel originally for? You know, mm -hmm. um, so something like that. I think it's really helpful. It's something that like little steps like that to document those are really helpful. Right. Yeah. It takes or time though, because this is not a natural reaction. It's not natural to write down stuff every time. So this is something that humans need to deliberately train, in my opinion. Emiliano, so you have been working remotely since day one, since you joined ARC like a couple of years ago. I feel like your communication style or how you think about communication with teammates must have evolved from you first joined and until now. So has your communication style evolved in this couple of years? Yes, it has. Uh, and a lot of it also has to do with my interactions with the organization, how things have changed, and also learning from clients. When I first joined, you know, I was the first remote employee. We had the office. There were many situations that were distant to me, topics or documents that I didn't know. We had a GitHub. We, you know, we had a GitHub with content for onboarding. We even wrote some of that. I don't know if you recall. Uh, Wait, so we really? Were all over I, I totally forgot yeah. about this. Yeah, you, you, you sent me an invite. I'm pretty sure I can. I can. <laughs> and so I was just kind of like sometimes not sure where things were written. And then we started to mature. We started to hire more, you know, other team members in sales working remotely. Our CEO coming to San Francisco and then being able to just sync without having a meeting. So Slack is like the matrix. 
there are threads that I store and I hold here because I know there's important intel there that I sometimes need to look back. There's maybe some team members, even if you're in an office on site, you don't really should interact. Maybe you drink coffee together, but hi, bye bye. When it's remote as well, it's very different. So I sometimes, you know, say say stuff to people randomly, like, hey, how are you? Do you remember me? We just joke around. So you know there's this guy, he's not in an island, he exists. He's got a face and so I guess, you know, that interaction of trying to also come across more approachable to other team members, that has grown in me because at the beginning there was just people in the team that I wouldn't have a reason to speak with and I wouldn't try. Yeah. And now that's more of a conscious effort. And Milan had it tough because he is the our very first remote hire at that time. And then, yeah, it's, it's, it was really tough for you. So props to you for getting through that. You've been sorry to interrupt, but this was my first remote job. So I was also learning on the job. I think we all were. It's not as if I was an OG, you know, guys, I've been doing this for a decade. You don't know anything about it. No, I didn't know. I didn't know anything back then. So it's been learning for everyone. It's been quite an interesting. Absolutely. So I want to move on to the next question when in regards to tools. What are the must-have tools for remote work? So in your opinion, what are the main tools that you think is the most useful for working remotely? It can be on, you know, on the personal level or even on the team level. This might sound cliche, but Zoom has really shaped the world. Yeah. You would think that you know, Sky was lying around before, but just hop into a Zoom call. It is very fast. It is very easy. So I think definitely Zoom is a life-changing tool that they have managed to, you know, put in the right direction. Slack might sound cliche as well, but the one-on-ones we have there, these might sound old school, but also always personally having notebook, paper, somewhere to write. It's really important because everything that I used to use Grammarly and drive a lot, but then you can type faster then you can write. So you, you know, you're not even thinking, you're like driving it. You don't know how you get home. It's the same problem. So being, you know, trying to elaborate more and then transcribe, it's been really useful for me to have meaningful notes when I speak with people or have one-on-ones. Yeah, I would definitely agree with Emiliano. Like I have this uh, little handwritten planner. I use a lot of tools, which I'll talk about in a minute, but like, it's really helpful to me to think like to force yourself, okay, we said writing things down is important, right? But actually physically writing down, what are my three goals for the week? The three things I must get done, I think really like focuses my energy. You can do it daily. I think, I I guess I do have like a daily must do, but my weekly must do's are things that kind of span obviously the entire week, but that's been really helpful. I usually separate into work and life as well. So like my life goals, like, okay, maybe this week, my goal is to get a good night's sleep every single week, every single day of the week. I think that really helps. So I do, I really like handwritten things as well. I definitely agree. I think Notion is essential for project planning. We use a mix of Notion and Airtable actually. So like I use Notion for anything that's text heavy, anything that's really, you know, like idea building or like thinking about like ad copy or anything like that is all done in Notion. That's really our go-to tool. And then Airtable, I use more for like project planning, like detailed task lists and connection between, if if you use OKRs, like we connect things between objectives, KRs, and then tasks. So I think like those two would be like go-to tools that maybe other people haven't used yet. And obviously Google Docs or like Google Sheets, all of those definitely need to have those. I think those are just kind of like default for sure. Also find a... A really easy to use screen recording or screen capturing tool is also very easy, especially when you're communicating with um, teammates about certain things to really just show you what you have on your screen. If you're just talking through like something like Slack. What do you use for that thing? I use CAP, K-A-P. I use Loom. So I think this is also a thing that we can try more because it's basically like you have the best of both worlds if you use, you know, screen recordings or even a voice recordings with tools like Loom. Because at the same time, you can work asynchronously, like you just throw a video out there. But it's also, it's a high fidelity stuff. So instead of writing it down, of course, writing, writing it down is important, but sometimes it's better when you have visual aids, right? So I starting or try to experiment with using Loom from time to time when I feel like, oh, this is too hard to write. 
So I just record a screen and, and then I'll record, hey, this is how you do it, blah, blah, blah. I want to try it. I actually haven't used Loom yet. I've seen that you do, yeah. but I, I want to start trying to use it, especially when like teaching other teammates how to like do things. It seems really useful. Yeah, I think for me, it's more like it depends on what you try to convey and how dense the information is. Hey, here's a like one minute video that you can just watch and then literally just emulate it at the same time. So, so in terms of home workspace, so what is the best way to set up my home workspace? So what's your workspace setup like? That's a great a question. Monitor. Ask, ask the pro. <laughs> ask Amelia. <laughs> you know, what? when I started, I was like, okay, I have a chair, I have a desk, I have a room. That's not where I sleep. I'm going to use that. And that's how I started. But this room has changed completely with starters. The chair I had was like the cheapest Costco chair. You would lean back and it would like, creak, 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 creak. you know, I, I feel like if I was still in that chair, probably I would have like a, you know, I would be in a hospital bed right now. So get something with lumbar support. Uh, your lower back is going to be thankful. Uh, I think this is really important. If you, if you can have a chair, just put a pillow and it's going to be equally, equally as good. But I like to lean back. So that was important for me. I have a desk lamp when it's nighttime, you know, because we're across multiple time zones. You don't want to burn your eyes, you know, because you see people getting closer to the screen. I used to do it a lot. Sometimes I still do. So now I have a desk lamp. I have blue light glasses. I don't need prescription glasses, but I noticed that if I don't wear the glasses and I'm having cold late, I need to put uh, something in my eyes, like drops, because I'm starting to feel like the burn. And that's also really important. Get a comfortable keyboard. That's, that's a good investment. Uh, you might think it's, it's not that important, but you're going to be thankful as well. Somewhere you can rest your palms, sometimes depending on the height of the keyboard. Uh, you know, you got to experiment. Having a different mouse than the MacBook Pro. I, I love the MacBook Pro mouse, but something that's more ergonomic, you know, it's going to be also really good. Uh, there are many great to have that are not mandatory, especially when you go and travel on the road. And then I don't have any of this. I can't ship my second screen. I love my dog. He can't be there. My Herman Miller share and whatnot. And I'm back to basics. And, and it's like, yeah, okay, you know, I can still pull it off. But I look back at thinking of, my home office and I'm like, yeah, damn, I miss the second screen or I miss the chair right now. So, you know, find those little details. And I guess when you're working from home and you look at the setup of somebody, you can tell they've put some work into, into this. The guys that have like the, the microphone that comes out and the crazy backgrounds that look amazingly artistic, you know, you just, just got to do something about it because you're, you're staring at it. Uh, through Zoom 24 seven. I like that you focus on like those little details. Cause I think like, I mean, I, I don't know what chair you should buy or what computer, like, you know, accessories you need, but I think the little things really make a difference. Like I just, I have this light up here that makes me look more like a human. <laughs> like, I yeah, think you yeah. take for granted, like how you appear on the screen really impacts, like just how your team, you know, feels or like the energy level that you, you look like you have. If you do it, like in my role, I do a lot of meetings, like I'm in meetings all day and like those things, like. It's not for me necessarily, but it's for making sure that I'm communicating in the best way with the rest of the team. So I'd say like invest in a light. Like I know another team member also uses like the selfie light. Do you, you just have a lamp though, right? I mean, you don't have like, you don't have the, the yeah. ring. No, no, I don't have the ring. I only have a, like a lamp, but you probably can see it. In but consider it. Yeah. Like it really, I think it makes a difference if you do a lot of calls. So like think about how you're spending your time. You might not need it, but like, I think that's something that I decided that I needed <laughs> good lighting. Yeah. You know, because some, somebody once told me, I was uh, having a call during the day and he's like, are you in a cave or what? And I realized, yeah, it was looking kind of, kind of dark. And I was like, yeah, no, it, lighting looks good to me. It doesn't look good to you. And, uh, you know, if you look as if you're in the witness protection program during a call and, and you look like shadow, <laughs> that's, that's the right time to change yeah. the lightning. It really forces I, you to empathize with what people are experiencing, not what you're experiencing. Yeah. I remember Emiliano used to, um, be, I remember in the early days, we used to record the, some of our sales calls with the, of course, with the client's permission. I remember Emiliano used to do the video calls in the, in his living room, I think. That's, that's when the lighting was terrible. Yeah. I would go to my oh, living yeah. room. I wanted to just kind of chill on the sofa and nobody could hear me. It was awful. Yeah. You remember those probably you saw the yeah. recordings when. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Back in the day. So I think for me and probably also for Ting, like I don't have a really good setting 
my work from home setting was really bad just because like I prefer to work at, you know, coffee shops or sometimes co-working space. So my, I have a really small space in my house to, you know, to focus on work. So what I do to make things less uncomfortable is sometimes I switch from my room. So my, my desk is in my room. And sometimes when I feel like, you know, unmotivated or you feel like I feel tired, I just move to the living room. So this change of environment, even though it's like from a non-ideal environment to another non-ideal environment, is actually still, still kind of <laughs> helps, you know? Yeah. That, that reminds me of one interesting thing that I read. I haven't personally tried it, but it's called the popcorn method. If you feel like you can't work from home very well, they suggest that you like every two or three hours, you kind of change position or like you go to the kitchen or you go to the living room or you go to, don't go to your bedroom. But like, but other than that, like just go around your house and change spots. So that, that's supposed to be a really good tip for like helping you focus because you can like focus on a task for those two hours. And when you switch tasks, you're also switching location. So I don't know if anyone has ever tried that. Yeah, I've tried that. I think it actually kind of helps because back when I was in Taiwan, it's kind of like I live with my grandma. So this, there isn't that much space. And sometimes I'm in the living room. Sometimes I have to go into my room. Just like switching back and forth kind of keeps it fresh. Yeah. Another thing is because if there's not that much space, I don't have that big of a setup. I've noticed. Oh, the moth stands. I found that it's really helpful because if I'm just working, yeah. just the tilted angle, it helps so much. How do you call it? The, the moth stands? There, there should be a Is name it for it, right? I don't know. Uh, by the way, for the, listeners, for the listeners, we're going to put a, like this? this on the show notes. Right. Oh. Is this what you mean? That I use this type of thing. I had something like that. I lost it. I get a cheap version of it and I miss it so much because I cannot <laughs> adjust the height. Yeah. So this is like a, a laptop stand that can change the angle of your laptop when, you, when you're typing. So, yeah. so yeah. Another question here is how do we share knowledge and processes within the team? So Christine already mentioned that we use tools like Notion or even sometimes Google Docs. But I'm curious, what do you guys think about the current knowledge transfer process in our team internally? Do you feel like it's good enough or do you feel like there are things that can be better? I think it's probably different from the sales team, from the marketing team and the engineering team. So I'm just curious what you guys think about this. Okay, from the marketing team, I would say... We're, we never have enough documentation as like when you have a new hire, you realize, yeah. you realize like, oh, you know what? That was obvious to me, but I didn't actually have it written down anywhere. So I think it becomes clear when you're hiring new people. So I think it depends on what stage of growth that you're at. Like it's something that, yeah, I would say it's kind of like eating well and exercising. Like everyone knows they need to do it, but actually doing it consistently is the hard part. So I think what we try to do is like, if you just have notion, as a default for every project you do or everything that you do. So like you start a new project, you put it, you write it down because you don't know when an SOP is going to become something that comes like an essential to your team. Like let's say um, launching a new ad campaign. At first it's just an experiment, but then it becomes something that you're doing over and over again. When you hire a new person, you also need them to do it. But if you start from the beginning as a default, you're always writing everything down, like the process that you're doing, all the steps you're doing, it makes it easier to go back and really make that something that you can share with another team member. So that's kind of like the, the way that we do it now is just default to writing it down. And sometimes we get, we have a lot of docs that we maybe never go back to, but I think in the end we kind of figure out, Oh, this is an essential one. We add it to our like essential marketing knowledge base that we then, you know, share with new team members. I think one thing that Christine mentioned about was onboarding. It's so recently our team, we had a process review and me and another hire, we were talking about how, I guess some thoughts we had about the onboarding process and some information that older teammates might've just, it came really easy. Whereas for us, it's kind of like we had to muddle around through it. And we had a little huddle where we kind of discussed, you know, what things we could improve on. And I think the whole process of having a process process review also helped with throwing ideas back and forth in terms of what we thought we could improve on and kind of keep everyone up to date in terms of how they, they were feeling about working within the team. The thing with sales, what I've seen is that there are many instances where we unconsciously learned that we weren't doing something, but that it was something that was setting us apart from other, other team members. Because especially in sales, the culture 
tends to be different from other teams and that's fine. Uh, but when it's remote, it just kind of augments that sense. You're like a hub that's sitting remotely and you have perhaps your own culture. And we started to notice that uh, my colleagues and I, that suddenly we weren't sure what the product team was thinking of our comments or what they were working on. And we didn't have visibility on each other's and we were having a lot of back and forth on Slack. And Slack is great, but it can also become a graveyard. You know, you can bury things there forever. Uh, and then we were like, why don't we make sure that in our meetings, we have like a one-on-one with these teams. And we specifically talk about this, you know, box of things that we want to know about each other. And, you know, suddenly we were like, yeah, that's brilliant. Let's just do it. We've, we've been missing out. And we started doing that. And you were like, yeah, jackpot. You know, we're on the same page now. Uh, so that was almost like an un- unconscious idea that came into mind. And we started playing with it. And it's been great. There are two interesting things here from what we've discussed just now is first one is onboarding. So I think onboarding is, is always tricky to optimize. Even co-located companies still has problems with onboarding process. Like in our company, it's better now, actually. So when I first joined, it was more of a sink and swim approach. And at that time, it was kind of okay because at that time, we were like 15, 16 people. So it's kind of, you can find your way in figuring things out. And I was at that time, we have, you know, have less clients, we have less processes and whatnot. But in these couple of years, actually, it's, it's totally different, right? When you first came on, actually, I think until now, people are still figuring out, okay, how to onboard this person well. And the second thing is process review. I think in our companies, only the product team has this process, internal process review. I think it's an interesting thing that we can have because like what Christine mentioned just now, probably there are some documents that we're not using anymore, but sometimes because we're too busy with other stuff, is then we forget, or other marketing campaigns, then we forget that to prune those things. I think this is something that in the near future, in the future, we can try to figure out and try to try to think, oh, will having this process review will make our marketing campaigns go better or sales campaigns uh, go better? Uh, I kind of have a hot take on process in general. Mm-hmm. I think it depends on what stage of the company you're in. I think oh, yeah. over-processing is not a good thing. I think process in general can be good or bad. Like it depends on like what you're doing with it. So I think if you're a company like in a stage where you're in, you're experimenting a lot, you're, you're kind of trying, trying to break things. You essentially know, maybe you're creating this process for three months, but you're not marrying yourself to this process and saying, you know what, I'm, a year from now, that's going to work. So I would say like, be, be nimble with the processes you're creating and be willing to like break them, I guess. And don't over process things. I would say this, this is speci- specific to like startups or really like fast growing companies or fast moving companies like default to action and don't like don't plan too much and over process something that doesn't need it i think uh, one of the an interesting way to think about this is i interviewed leah martin the cmo of a startup called time doctor and he has this interesting mindset when it comes to documentation process so if you the first time you do something don't document it the second time you do the same thing, think about how would you document it. The third time you do it and you document it at the same time. So basically you want to, the, 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 main, the main idea here is to avoid repetition, so, so to speak. So if there's something that you repeat all the time, you need to make it like somewhat late. Not formal process. Formal sounds a bit rigid, but it's more like a, a well a well-documented process where you can kind of like tweak and optimize in the future or probably just eliminate when things change. So the next thing is I want to talk a bit on the engineering side of things or remote engineering teams. Let's talk about how do we do code review. So Ting, can you share a bit more about our engineering code review process? Are there any guidelines on it? So currently our process, we usually with each feature we do, once we've completed the feature, we push onto a GitHub, a GitHub which is a repository sharing. And on, on GitHub, there's actually code review tools that we can use within 
um, the pull request. And then we kind of have the back and forth where it's kind of, we'll have teammates saying, oh, you maybe you could change this, this. And that's kind of how we have our code review. So I guess in a sense, it's already async and remotely, even when we weren't remote. So we had that whole process going on. And generally, we don't have one-on-one, -on -one, I guess, one-on-one -on -one code reviews where you're kind of um, paired up with an another person and they individually kind of have a meeting with you about your code. Rather, it's more of an asynchronous process over GitHub. So is there any particular guidelines on how you should review things? For example, um, how do you tell the other person, like, what's wrong with this code and how do you fix it? Is there any particular communication guidelines there? Generally, when we look at code reviews, we want to look at the bigger picture first. It's like, okay, look mm -hmm. at what they're making and I guess the big main points that they should be hitting on in terms of logic. And then, because within a code review, you can never really catch all the small nitty gritty details. So we only have time to really look at the big picture. Are they hitting the main things? And within that, we'll kind of work into it. Or if there's small details like, oh, they missed, uh, there's... Uh, I guess redundant code that you don't need being over communication, I guess, is always a good thing. Maybe providing an example of what you were thinking really helps the other person gain insight in terms of what they're recommending. Yeah. How about the tone? There's sometimes when code reviews can be a bit too, a bit too straightforward, so to speak. Basically, yeah, like I've seen you that around. Yeah, accidentally saying that your code sucks, something like that. So I'm just curious, like, what's the the mindset that we have in the engineering team that to avoid this kind of communication breakdown? So actually, within our team, I haven't ran into any issues where it's very straightforward. Um, rather, yeah. it's more. It's kind of like if you don't understand what someone is doing, you could always ask why, like how come you're doing it this way? And then you gain a little bit more insight and rather asking why they're doing something. It's, I think it was, it's a really good way of going about it. And once you see the process, maybe you can pinpoint, oh, you know, this is where um, you can change things a little. And that's kind of what I've noticed between um, our team. Hmm. So another thing that I'm still curious about is, pair programming do we do pair programming in our engineering team like i actually don't know <laughs> yeah actually we do so we routinely i think every bi-weekly we usually have a pair programming session and we'll get paired up with another team member we'll find like a small bug that we fix together so when we were co-located it was easier because you kind of pair up and you sit next to each other you have like a driver and a passenger someone saying like verbally saying how you could go about it and someone typing and then moving remotely we've been testing out different tools to work with like most of the time we use Zoom because Zoom, you can just screen share. There's remote control access if you needed to. So that was really helpful. But then we also played around with another, tested out another product called Tuple, which actually, it was a really smooth experience using it. Do you think like pair programming itself, like the, the process of pair programming itself, do you feel like it's especially helpful when you're a remote uh, engineering teams? I think it helps in terms of because when you're remote, you don't get that that much time to work together with your teammates. A lot of time you're just really working on your own. Sometimes you'll slack uh, coworkers to ask about questions. But other than that, most of the time it's you facing your, your code and having pair programming. I feel like it also helps with you know building up relationships with your teammates. Another thing that we've covered a lot in the FAQs is everything about meetings. We have several questions. How do I help my team get more comfortable doing remote meetings? How do I prepare and run a remote meeting a, effectively? So just curious right now, we've been running um, remote meetings for a couple of months, like fully remote meetings. So how do you guys feel about this? Was there any difference in terms of the meeting dynamics I mean, I know you've been joining remotely for a while, but I feel like right now, because everyone is distributed now, right? Before everyone was co-located, like Emiliano and some of our team members would be kind of like isolated because like we have 25 something people in the same meeting room and like three or four people remotely. So probably, Christine probably can start 
can talk a bit about this. So how do you think the meeting dynamics has changed? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a best practice that you, even if you have a team in the same office and you have remote team members, you, you have everyone on their own, like one face per screen, basically, like their own laptop in different rooms because you don't want to make it so that like people can hear jokes when they're sitting together and then the remote team members can't. I think that's like an example of kind of what's happened in the past. So now that everyone's remote, I think um, the sound quality is just a bit better for everyone. No one's dealing with like this one speaker in the middle of the room. I think he was nodding his head. Yeah. Um, like I think that was huge. Like you could really never clearly hear things that were happening in the office if you were a remote team member. And I, I, I think that there's been more thought in, that goes into meetings like in advance. Like you can't just wing it. I think you can always, you can try to wing a meeting, but when you're remote, I think it just forces you to think about like how you're using the time a little bit better. Like just making sure you have an agenda and that, not that every single time that happens, but I think more than it happened before, you'd have more clear agendas and things to keep meetings running smoothly. I think one big thing about having remote meetings is having your video on. I know, um, so every day for the dev team, we have daily standups to keep us, keep the whole team updated on what we're doing. And initially when we first started remote, everyone had their cameras off. So it just felt very isolated. You know, when other people were talking, you could technically be doing other stuff and people wouldn't really notice. And it kind of created that disconnect. Whereas when we started having our cameras on, you started feeling a little bit closer to your teammates. Like you still see them face to face. It's, it pulls the distance a little closer. Yeah, definitely keep your camera on. When we started having meetings, you know, between the office and remote, some of you would speak and I wouldn't be able to see you. Uh, you would be like hiding in the crowd. And now that we're all in Zoom, when you speak, you know, you're repeating my computer. I know how you look like, even though you're in a different team and you know, we don't even have to chat. I'm like, oh, so this is this person. Hey, <laughs> you know, it's really important to putting a name to people. So another kind of meeting is, of course, you know, uh, when you have one-on-ones. I want to talk a bit about feedback and criticism because even though you can still have feedback criticism face to face right it's still slightly different like there's another layer of of medium there which is a zoom so it's not like you're sitting side by side it's more like face to face i don't know if you notice but there's a subtle difference if you having one on one you know on a park bench like sitting side by side with your manager and on zoom i personally feel like there's a some like nuance there mm-hmm. i feel like when you side by side it feels more friendly like less pressure but when you're on zoom it's it's just inev- inevitable even though this is this is still much better than you know zoom with our videos i think the question for uh christine is how do you think about giving feedback and criticism especially when it's on a remote settings yeah and for thing in emiliano i'm just curious like how would you prefer um getting your feedback and criticism from your managers so i think this whole you know this during this conversation we've said default to writing the exception is when you're giving critical feedback do not default to writing so i think it's easy like if it's a small thing like hey fix the apostrophe in that sentence or something yeah like that that's fine but i think if you're really trying to explain the nuance of something or you're trying to get a team member to learn like um like okay here's the expectation like here's where you kind of didn't meet the expectation you don't want them to read into things that you're typing you don't want them to think like oh my gosh am i going to be fired or something because like my boss is, is unhappy with my performance so if it's anything performance related i think just say hey would you mind jumping on like a five minute call to talk about xyz you just talk about the issue. You can deliver it with that body language and that empathy that will come across better. You know, it's not face to face, but it's screen to screen. Like it does come across better. And just like, hey, like I noticed you did it this way. You know, it'd be better. It'd be more effective if you do it this way next time. I think it's it's just more effective. And so that's like all the advice we've given. Like meetings should have agendas and default to communication by by text. I think it's kind of the opposite when it comes to these kind of meetings. You don't need to have an agenda when you're giving critical feedback, but you just have those quick calls and just yeah, like show that you're human. And usually, the the receiver is also like more receptive to that kind of thing. Yeah, a big point that um, Christine 
Christine mentioned was communication. When we're commu- a large part of communication is the verbal, the the gestures, your emotion, everything that really builds up to what you're trying to say. And being able to do that over video is the next best next best thing you have to doing it in person. When it comes to sales and and working remotely, tracking your performance and being really honest with yourself, I think it's a big component. If you know, you know. Uh, well, this is the revenue I had in mind, and nowhere near that. Uh, you know it, you feel it. So you know when it comes to one-on-one, hey, w- what is going on? So you you wouldn't you shouldn't be surprised. You know you should be aware that maybe you're falling apart in in some angles. So that's that's really important. But having an agenda really helps. I know my one-on-ones, what's their schedule like, and I know when there's going to be you know some feedback and what is going to be some comments. Uh, it's, it's never a surprise. It, it should be like schedule mm-hmm. expect. Expect some comments every now and then. Maybe like great work, you know, we're crushing it, or what happened with this deal? You know, I, I noticed this. What's up? Got it. So so basically, ideally, you prefer like before any one on one, you want to have like a high level agenda of what criticism that you might you might get, and also what feedbacks or even positive side you might get, so you can like somewhat prepare on that. Is that what you think? I think the preparation comes from my end of yeah, being self-conscious and knowing like, you know, I'm probably going to expect some feedback and, and with this regard or some comments here. So, you know, don't, don't be surprised. Like, hey, really? Am, am I doing this uh, a bad work here? Like you should be aware. And, and when it happens to you that you get some comments that you weren't aware of, you got to be really mindful and really take notes of that. Hmm. Got it. I want to move on on the topic of uh, trust, which is totally related to art in terms of remote hiring. So one of the questions that we have here is, how do I know the team is getting things done? Uh, For this part, I wanna start with Emiliano first, since in our business, we help clients hire remote engineers all over the world, right? And some of them, either they just started hiring remotely or probably they have been hiring remotely for a while, but still haven't, got to that sweet spot in terms of remote management. So I'm just curious, how do you explain to these clients or let's say if for the listeners here, they're trying to hire remotely, but they have, they still have this trust issues in, in coworkers they cannot see physically. How do you help them understand? Yeah, my thing is, unless there's a compliance request mandatory by the government or some other power that it need to be on site, then that's it. You know, go ahead. You got to focus on on site. Otherwise, you should, you should be flexible. Why do you want this developer to be working right next to you? Are you going to be micromanaging, you know, looking over the shoulder the whole day? They most likely, even if they're in the same state, they would rather work from home where they feel more comfortable. They will do the reporting and you will be able to measure their output. There are many great tools out there for time tracking. We at Arc in our dashboard, we have, we have one, but we tell them, use whatever you like. You know, what's your setup? What's your environment to manage developers? You don't have to make any, you know, any changes besides you know, the fact that they're going to be, you know, reporting all of their progress and all of their work. Uh, if you can't trust your employees with them working, then I can't imagine how, you know, you just got to make the comparison. I, you can't imagine that you're tracking every single employee looking over their shoulder. Why would you do this to the, to the software developers? Yeah. So, Christine, so how do you, since you're a manager, how do you figure out if on the hiring stage that you can trust this particular person? Is there any particular questions you ask or something? Yeah. I mean, tr- trust isn't like, isn't like a black or white thing. Like it's, it's evolves over time. It's like an ongoing, it's like, it's part of your relationship with any individual. So I think in the hiring process, you have to be really honest. What am I looking for in this uh, ideal candidate? What's my ideal candidate? You should actually have a profile that says, okay, I want these technical skills and evidence that they've done this in the past. Like if you're looking for someone, I don't know, to run ads, for example, you want to be honest with yourself. Like, okay, I'm looking for someone with that experience. Or if you're not, you say, you know what, maybe I don't need that exact experience, but they need experience with data or something. You need to be really clear about the technical skills. And then also on, I would say I would break in soft skills and cultural skills into two pieces. Be clear about like what cultural fit is to you, to your team. 
like maybe say the company and your team, what are those essential critical skills, like soft skills they need to have, like obviously for remote teams communication. And then like maybe there's certain cultural values such as, you know, work hard, play hard. I don't know, whatever it is in your team. And you have to make sure that that matches. So it's your job as a hiring manager to make sure that when you're hiring, you're being honest with this position and you're seeing if that candidate is a match. Because I think it's really easy to say like, hey, I really like this client, this candidate. They really fit maybe the, the cultural values part and the technical skills, but you've completely forgot about these soft skills that are really important to be a successful member of your team. So I think if you're a new manager, it's sort of, it's a bit harder because maybe you don't know all of those things. You're kind of guessing, oh, do we really value this, this skill? I'm not really sure. So it's something that you kind of evolve over your time, over time in your own like hiring toolkit. Like these are the essentials and these are the questions I ask to get at those things. So Emiliano, when a potential client uh, comes to you, what what was the average level of preparedness when they come to you? Like Christine mentioned that you basically, you basically you need to kind of like figure out the ideal persona of the candidates you're looking for. What are your skills? Are you good with a uh, JavaScript? Are you good with Python? Do usually, do these clients usually come to you prepared or do you think are most of them are like semi-prepared? Like what's the level there? It really does depend. And I've probably I've seen mm-hmm. a shift in the past 12 months because traditionally I would get on a call with many companies that have no remote experience. They just want to get the benefits of having the great developer regardless of where they are, but they come with many doubts. Like how should I communicate? Is there, what are your recommendations? How do I even interview, you know, because you want me to get on a call with them. How do I know they're, they're the right fit if you already vetted them? So, you know, I, I would always tell them, how are you working right now? What's your approach? How do you actually interview the developers that are sitting in your office? You know, you made sure there was a cultural fit during the interview after you made sure that they were technically a fit proficient in what you're looking for. So, you know, you got to do the same, the same thing over Zoom. This person is going to have the camera on. We should expect the same from you. And if this is somebody that you can work with, have a cup of coffee, you know, imagine in a heated discussion, then you're going to, you're going to play well with each other. And most recently, I'm starting to see more companies that they're like, yeah, well, we've hired more remote developers or we're, we've gone entirely distributed. So they're more just focused on hiring the best person, regardless of where they're sitting. So for all of those that don't have that much of experience, the pushback is how do I manage my remote developers? How do I manage my remote developer? And they're going to start with just one person. And the thing is, what, what's the setup that is currently working right now with uh, your current team? You got to have a similar approach and repackage that to that new hire. Potentially, that means having a lot of FaceTime. If you're hiring a developer, but you're not having any calls, it's just emails or Slack, that's, you know, that's going to be detrimental to the relationship. And I tried to get on a call in the first week of work and see what's their experience, how they've been communicating. And if I could almost put this in, in percentages, if they've been communicating, having video calls, you know, 99% of chances that things are going amazing. If not, they're like, yeah, I have some questions. I have some doubts, actually. How do I address this? And then I'm like, when's the last time you spoke with him or with her? We have, oh, well, I sent him a Slack message or a Skype message. Well, you know, there, there's, it's not the same thing uh, as you're doing or the same treatment that you offer to your on-site employees. Yeah. So I think a, um, an overarching theme here uh, when it comes to, you know, working with remote team members or high remote team members or even other stuff like meetings, it's basically, it's, I, I feel like the big takeaway is, is about intentionality. Like stuff like Emiliano mentioned, if clients doesn't trust the developer or an employer doesn't trust uh, his or her employee, it's more like there's no intentionality or um, a proactive action to reach out to figure out what's happening or how we can work on this together. I think it applies to every aspect on working remotely. Either you want to document stuff or if you want to run a meeting, more preparation needs to be done because you're, you're not in the same location. One last question that I want to ask you, what positive things that working from home or remote work has bring to you? Yeah, that's, it's difficult for me to think of just one, one answer, but 
there's some small things that I probably miss when I'm working on the road or, but that's actually a benefit having a family that lives somewhere else in the world, knowing that I can go visit them, especially if they're closer to my time. So like Brazil, my sister going to visit her and working there. Uh, that's amazing. You know, so no, no, no cutting out people cooking from home. I think that's great. You know, like just buy bulk, buy chicken and then just cook it when it's uh, lunch time. Some people are against it, but you don't have to take a lot of time cooking. You can do like a 20 minutes thing. Having your own commute mentally, maybe somebody works to the, goes to the office, me knowing that I'm going to walk my dog, I'm going to do a coffee, X number of days I'm going to hit the gym. That's also part of a ritual that it's easier to stick to some sort of routine when uh, you don't have any constraints like traffic jam and whatnot. I think a large part for me would be because I'm home more and if I'm living with family, it's like the little things that I can help out around the house while working. That can be a plus and a minus (laughs) at the same time. And obviously the, the no commute time is a big plus. Yeah, I think, I think for me, I mean, there's tons of great things. I mean, I have dogs, so I get to spend more time with my dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have two dogs. That's the best, right? But I think it forces you to, really be like self-disciplined about everything but like I mean then I was talking about cooking I've definitely started cooking more as well just really like you can't you can't like put off like your your life I don't know your life becomes more obvious to you like oh hey like why am I ordering uber eats all the time I don't know you just kind of feel like it takes you take stock of like what you're doing and how you're spending your time because I don't feel like I'm not rushing around I'm just in my same space all the time so yeah, positive things, more time with my dogs, more cooking. And I would say just like my quality of work is better in a way. Like I'm able to like work really early in the morning where I do my best work, do a bit more deep work. I'm not like confined to like the, the schedule. I mean, our, our hours are pretty much within the same, same range, but I can kind of adjust my schedule a little bit to work when I'm most productive. Yeah, even though... The whole world is going remote or working from home in because of a very unfortunate reason, which is the pandemic. But I think it's also a good time for us to kind of like revisit, you know, our daily life and what we what is really important for us and what is not important for us. So that's the uh, bright side that I hope can people can realize. It doesn't take so much to be productive and happy. So. To speak. So I think it's a good uh, point to end this interview. So again, Ting, Emiliano, Christine, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us, yes. Thank you. So yes, so for the listeners, if you want to listen more of the podcast and other episodes, just go to our website and you can find a the list of our podcasts. And hopefully when this is out, the new podcast landing page is going to go live. It probably is. So yes, again, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jovian. And that's it for another episode of Outside the Valley brought to you by ARC. We created this podcast with the hope that in each episode, you can learn something new from other remote startup people. So if you have any feedback or suggestions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at jovian at arc.dev. It's J-O-V-I-A-N at A-R-C dot D-E-V. Or you can find us on Twitter at arc.dev. See you next week with another episode of Outside the Valley and ciao.